Quote, The good fortune of my existence, its uniqueness perhaps, lies in its fatality. I am, to express it in the form of a riddle, already dead as my father, while as my mother I am still living and becoming old. This dual descent, as it were, both from the highest and the lowest rung on the ladder of life, at the same time a decadent and a beginning, this, if anything, explains that neutrality, that freedom from all partiality in relation to the total problem of life, that perhaps distinguishes me. I have a subtler sense of smell for the signs of ascent and decline than any other human being before me. I am the teacher par excellence for this. I know both. I am both. End quote. That's from the opening section of Ecce Homo, entitled Why I Am So Wise. Nietzsche describes himself in somewhat self-contradictory terms here, but they are contradictions that you might call a rich contradiction. He's a decadent and a beginning. His father, a kind, mellow, simple man, a Christian, a man who died young, and his mother, a hearty, healthy woman. Nietzsche's ill health characterizes his entire life, but it's counterbalanced with a determination to overcome that state of ill health. Through his state of mind, through his willpower, through his commitment to a firm life, Nietzsche has both ascent and decline within him, which again is a contradiction in terms. It's vitality that's rising simultaneously with a vitality that's falling. But because of this somewhat paradoxical fate, he has a nose for both of those modes of being. He can recognize both. He can enjoy a sense of neutrality. It's a practical kind of fairness, which we might describe as an indifference toward the outcome. For Nietzsche, an indifference toward whether his philosophical or psychological inquiries would lead him to conclusions that were edifying or horrifying. And through this indifference, this possibility for fairness, Nietzsche can therefore be honest. Nietzsche once described Socrates as a man with a kind of inversion of his conscience and his will. What Nietzsche meant by this is that Socrates described an unwavering inner voice of conscience that he called his daemon. He explicitly says that this daemon never encouraged him to do or say anything. It only dissuaded. It arose to warn him not to say something, not to do something, not to say or do things that he did not believe or that were unvirtuous or dishonest. And thus, where Socrates is creative is in terms of his intellect, his conscience, on the other hand, his impulses, his instinct is always negative. It's always reacting. Nietzsche says that in most men, this is the reverse. We discussed this a bit last week in our assessment of Socrates' apology. Here, I would levy the charge that Nietzsche has a similarly monstrous inversion of which most of Ecce Homo is the confession. In most people, it is in terms of physical or material combat and competition that they attempt to dominate and exercise their will. The competitive spirit tends to emerge in sports, in games, in the market, perhaps in literal physical competition and combat or in literal warfare. But when it comes to one's moral ideas, however, we tend to become soft and express some recapitulation to the values of pity, of ending suffering, of self-sacrifice, and so on. We spend our lives in competition with one another to climb the dominance hierarchies of the social life. We struggle for the feeding ground within the domain of capitalist competition. We celebrate ritualized forms of combat such as organized sports or martial arts or games of skill, whether as audience or participant. Even those of us with the modern luxuries of living in relative peace and safety get to enjoy that very prosperity because of the willingness of the young people of our society, or at least some proportion of them, to struggle with other nations for the control of the world's resources. On the macro scale, the, the conflict can still be quite violent, can still be quite aggressive. In short, if we honestly and critically examine our lives and the common patterns of the lives around us, we find that we all seek our happiness in these struggles and contests. And yet, when we articulate our moral principles, we tend to emphasize the need to put others ahead of oneself. We emphasize kindness and generosity as chief virtues. And above all, we capitulate to the values of Christianity in whatever form they come to us. 
For Nietzsche, it is the reverse. When we look to his life, we find a man who never had to struggle or compete for anything. He even says in this book that as a professor, he never had to struggle with his students, really. Even the most disobedient and disruptive students were easy for him to work with. His natural talent, his natural charisma always opened doors for him. Things often seem effortless for Nietzsche. Alas, his career at university was not the rise to superstardom that everyone had predicted, and even though he'd gotten his professorship so easily and so young, it was snatched away just as easily by his worsening eyesight and increasing pains. That was his fate, likely a congenital defect inherited from his father, rendering him a weak and sickly person. He lived in solitude and obscurity, preferring to withdraw from the social competition rather than engage in it. He was routinely described as kind, shy, gentlemanly. When we look to the moral philosophy that Nietzsche articulates, however, it is the very opposite of the Christian values that rule the intellectual world of the average person. Nietzsche's philosophy seems practically designed to be unpalatable to the soft-hearted person. It continually eschews any moral or metaphysical comforts in exchange for a kind of brute realism that Nietzsche in Ecce Homo insists upon. He even writes in his notes that this harsh way of philosophizing is a kind of medicine for him and a cure for his sickness. It is a repost against the feeling of weakness or helplessness. In sum, Nietzsche's philosophy is the affirmation of suffering, war, death, the agonistic competition, as all being essential aspects of life. And thus he expresses his instincts for war and cruelty, but in the moral realm. And he's quite successful, albeit posthumously, as a philosopher, while in his personal life behaving rather gently and it must be said, often ineffectively in the physical realm. For most of us, as has been argued, the reverse is true. And so, as I see it, this is a parallel to Socrates, in that Nietzsche, by fate, was handed a character that was a flip-flop of the moral equipment possessed by most human beings. It's one of the reasons that his confession here, in Ecce Homo, bears comparison to the Apology. Of course, traditionally, this comparison was ignored in favor of a comparison to Jesus, which is invited by the title of the work, Ecce Homo, Behold the Man. That's a quotation referring to Jesus, uh, uttered by Pilate. Kaufman writes in his introduction to the text, quote, Plato's Socrates had claimed in his apology that he was the wisest of men, not because he was so wise, but because his fellow men were so stupid, especially those who were considered the wisest, for they thought they knew what in fact they did not. And Socrates, accused of impiety and corrupting the youth of Athens, argued that he was actually the city's great benefactor and deserving of the highest honors. Thus, Ecce Homo could have been entitled Variations on a Theme by Socrates. That would have been an artistic title, but out of the question for a writer who had just finished The Antichrist. Ecce Homo, the words Pilate had, according to John in 19.5, spoken of Jesus, behold the man, seemed more to the point. But that point was not to suggest any similarity between himself and Jesus, more nearly the opposite. Here is a man. Here is a new, a different image of humanity, not a saint or a holy man any more than a traditional sage but a modern version. End quote. In Kaufman's argument, then, Nietzsche, by choosing this title, Ecce Homo, Behold the Man, does not intend a comparison with Jesus, but a contrast. In terms of the book's content, Ecce Homo is instead Nietzsche's apology, rather than his night in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not the work of a man struggling to cope with his imminent parting from the world, because Nietzsche, unlike Jesus, or Socrates for that matter, did not really know that his demise was coming, other than a vague sense that it could happen at any time. And, in fact, even though madness struck him relatively quickly after completing Ecce Homo, he lived for another 11 years after that point. Rather, it was because Nietzsche was a man who had long since accepted the fact that he could die any time that allowed him to live in this sense that every day was absolutely precious and that there was no time on earth to be wasted.
Like Socrates, he departs the world, at least the world of the sane, with the assertion that he has come on a special mission to better humanity, to offer us a great gift. What is Nietzsche's great gift? Well, he begins the preface to Ecce Homo by saying, quote, I must confront humanity with the most difficult demand ever made of it, end quote. Also, like Socrates, he's been regarded as an evil person and a corrupter of those who uh, take on his ideas, though even here Nietzsche's case is different, since these accusations have usually been posthumous, uh, unlike with Socrates. Now, Ecce Homo is essentially broken into two main parts. First, the preface introducing the text and a series of autobiographical essays by Nietzsche with very cheeky titles, Why I Am So Wise, Why I Am So Clever, Why I Write Such Good Books. Then the middle of the text contains the other part, Nietzsche's reviews and reflections on his own books. Then he has a concluding essay, which I would consider to be of the same style and spirit as the first part, called Why I, I Am a Destiny, or Why I, I Am a Fatality. In this episode, we're not going to look at the book reviews. That will be saved for a later date. For today, we're considering Nietzsche's reflections on his life, the story he tells us about the, the course of his life, but more so than getting into the autobiographical details, we're going to concern ourselves with the wisdom that Nietzsche distills from life, how his method in this book reveals something about Nietzsche's philosophy. The core of this insight is the centrality of physiology in Nietzsche's work, how his life instructed him in this key aspect, perhaps the definitive aspect of his thought. We see in the autobiographical sections of Ecce Homo a work of immense prescience, Nietzsche's concern with how his legacy would be interpreted. We already have the example of Zarathustra's ape in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the false prophet who distorts the ideas of Nietzsche. Uh, and here in the preface, Nietzsche begs us, quote, above all, do not mistake me for someone else, end quote. As for who that true Nietzsche is, I would direct our attention again to this idea at the beginning of why I am so wise. Nietzsche's view of himself is that he's the kind of person who was made strong by what should have made him weak. He celebrated life within conditions that would make life hated by many. Not in spite of these conditions, but because of them. He was a man who lived with illness and the constant possibility of death, who lived in a time he considered to be a period of decline, who nevertheless regards all these facts about his existence with gratitude. This is what made me who I am. That's Nietzsche's great insight. It's the core of his Amor Fati idea, part and parcel with the challenge of eternal recurrence. Everything in which we take joy depends upon that which we find sorrowful. Everything that is must be and thus is necessary. That one can't simply pick and choose and say yes to one aspect of life, but you know, do without the other aspects and uh, celebrate some aspects of their life, but regret others, that every fact of one's existence must be regarded as necessary. And thus, to say yes to one aspect is to say yes to every aspect. Nietzsche, in other words, without his illness, is not Nietzsche. And therefore, he can't regret that he was born with this illness, or lament that he lived under the great pain of this illness, nor say that he wished it hadn't happened. I mean, he, I guess he could, but to do so would be to hate his entire life, to reject the entirety of who he was, or to feel in a sort of divided state, right? Where uh, we wish that we could pick and choose. We live in, in some regrets and we have some things that we're grateful for. That's probably the state of the average person is a dividedness about their lives. This idea is, in some respect, the golden note that sounds throughout the volumes of Nietzsche's philosophy, the overtone that shimmers in every major Nietzschean work from the time of birth of tragedy all the way to the very last book. We could say rather tritely that it's the love of life, but in another sense, there's probably no other term for it than amor fati, the love of fate. Another way of formulating this idea is in the preface of this work, Eke Homo, and this will harken back to the topic upon which I first began this podcast discussing that of the true world and the apparent world. Hopefully by now your understanding of this fundamental problem will be far richer than it was uh, when we introduced the idea back then, but there is a sense in which we might even be able to relate this idea to a more fati insofar as the real world, the physical, is this world of necessity, whereas the ideal or true world is this place of arbitrary moral whim. To embrace the so-called apparent world 
recognizing sensation as the experiential reality, to, to do that is to embrace necessity. And when we're unable to do this out of a resentment toward what fate has handed us, then we begin to pursue moral and metaphysical ideas. The similarities to the Apology of Socrates become quite apropos here, as Socrates in Plato's Republic gives us the allegory of the cave, the basis for this very ideal world. And in that work, Socrates refers to our apparent world, the world that appears, in which we feel and desire and experience, that is the illusion. He calls the, the world of the forms, or of the ideal, the only true world. Nietzsche says, quote, the last thing I should promise would be to improve mankind. No new idols are erected by me. Let the old ones learn what feet of clay mean. Overthrowing idols, my word for ideals, that comes closer to being part of my craft. One has deprived reality of its value, its meaning, its truthfulness, to precisely the extent to which one has mendaciously invented an ideal world. The true world and the apparent world, that means the mendaciously invented world and reality. The lie of the ideal has so far been the curse on reality. On account of it, mankind itself has become mendacious and false down to its fundamental instincts, to the point of worshipping the opposite values of those which alone would guarantee its health, its future, its lofty right to the future. End quote. And so, while this statement of Nietzsche's philosophical project, I think, is relatively clear. A consequence of this is that, unlike Socrates, Nietzsche cannot come to quote-unquote improve mankind. He doesn't think of his project that way, because unlike Socrates, who wishes to educate the mind, raise man up from his previous state of ignorance um, into becoming a, a virtuous creature in some sense, Nietzsche's task is to redeem what is, to make mankind as he is innocent, not bounded by moral commandments that he can never measure up to, which always end with man being eternally condemned. An ideal, whether it's a moral ideal, a philosophical ideal, a religious ideal, or whatever, is mendaciously invented. That is to say, a deception, a falsification. The reference to idols, learning what it means to have feet of clay, uh, that's a reference to the Bible, a, d a dream about a colossal statue in the book of Daniel, the head of gold and various other parts of silver, brawn, iron, the metals becoming lesser in value until you reach the feet, which are made of clay. The metaphor here is that the ideals are an edifice of humanity, which is beautiful or regal seeming, but cannot support its own weight, the weight, the ponderousness of its own splendor. They're built on a foundation which is merely clay. Is Nietzsche's overman an ideal? Well, Nietzsche does not make new idols, as he says here, and elsewhere in his work, he explicitly denies the assertion that his work posits any ideals whatsoever. Zarathustra, by preaching the overman, doesn't teach an ideal in the moral sense, because his every teaching about the overman is from the framework of amorality. Nietzsche describes Zarathustra in this very book as an annihilator of morality. Nevertheless, I think the clearest way of squaring the circle here is to see Nietzsche's philosophy as the self overcoming of idealism. What I mean by this is we can regard the overman as an ideal, yes, but it's an ideal of a world with no ideal. That mankind transcends this mendaciously invented world by ceasing to believe in moral idealism, by ceasing to judge ourselves and our actions according to this falsehood. And so Nietzsche says he has to confront us with that most terrible demand, the most terrible demand that's ever been made of us the task to embrace fate, not as blind, unhistorical animals, but to embrace fate consciously. To live consciously without idealism. Paradoxically, that's an ideal, since we currently live within idealism. And so, arguably, Nietzsche's teaching could be said to reject what is in favor of what ought to be. One might raise the obvious objection, isn't this demand intended to spur mankind on to some sort of improvement, to improve us by freeing us from idealism. Doesn't Nietzsche write in Zarathustra that man is a bridge and not a goal, so on and so forth. And this is all true, and here perhaps the most satisfactory answer is that he who reaches his ideal transcends it by the same token. As one of Nietzsche's epigrams goes in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche communicating via language and with 
the medium of philosophy, uses the ideal as a means of smashing ideals. He creates an idol to symbolize the smashing of idols. And so he replicates the brilliance of the Greeks with their dramatic tragedies. Nietzsche had written in Birth of Tragedy as to how the Greek tragedy was a Dionysian event. The representation of the mysteries of Dionysus, which are the destruction of the ego, the death and rebirth of the hero, continual rhythm and renewal of life through the destruction of its individual elements. And yet, in order to represent the Dionysian in this way, the dramas drew upon the power of Apollo, the god of dreams, of form and boundaries, the patron god of sculptors, of the regular rhythms of the kithara, thus the god who creates images, harnessed to create an image of the breaking of images, the god of individuation as giving rise to the symbol of Dionysus in the form of an individual, Dionysus who is an avatar of raw nature, and Dionysus contains a thousand self-contradictions. He's the blurring of all lines and boundaries. He is, by definition, indefinite. And as an individual, he's a multiplicity. So this is the true meaning of Greek tragedy to Nietzsche, an interaction of these two art forces. And so by analogy, this is what Nietzsche has offered us uh, whenever he has appeared to offer a new idol or a new ideal. If we take him seriously here in Eke Homo, his goal was to cast the smashing of idols into the mold of an idol. What may appear on the surface as the idealism of Nietzsche or a desire to improve mankind is fundamentally different from such moral evaluations of man or such metaphysical idealism regarding the world. Rather, Nietzsche's entire purpose in adopting these heuristics is to shake us out of the metaphysical and moral interpretations of mankind to interpretations that are naturalistic and based on necessity to evaluate based on the reality rather than this world of consciously created illusions. Perhaps the greatest difference between Nietzsche's anti-ideal and the moral idealism of old is that he does not evaluate whether one accepts or rejects it as springing from their intelligence or unintelligence, their wisdom or their ignorance, their morality or their immorality. He doesn't think that we accept or reject based on free will. He writes in part three of the preface, quote, How much truth does a spirit endure? How much truth does it dare? More and more that became for me the real measure of value. Error, faith in the ideal, is not blindness. Error is cowardice. Every attainment, every step forward in knowledge follows from courage, from hardness against oneself, from cleanliness in relation to oneself. I do not refute ideals. I merely put on gloves before them. End quote. And so we might recall Nietzsche's phrasing in Beyond Good and Evil. The measure of the strength of one's spirit is, it might be measured in how much truth one can tolerate. To what degree does one have to have the truth sweetened or falsified? Here, as he goes on to describe his writing as inherently cold, and he employs that metaphor of wandering in forbidden country, uh, that's his metaphor for the type of philosophy that he does. His work concerns itself with topics upon which the community has set its ban. Truth-seeking for Nietzsche is reconceptualized not as a matter of intellectual effort or study, not as a moral commitment to the truth, but a willingness to face up to the truth, in spite of how terrifying it might be or how painful it might be. And so courage is the main quality needed to seek the truth. And the ultimate courage is needed to strive for the forbidden, as Nietzsche puts his demand. And what you need as a philosopher, therefore, is inner hardness. And later he says cleanliness. That is abstinence, swearing off of all metaphysical and moral comforts. This various uh, different means of language that Nietzsche uses to talk about this all indicates that truth-seeking is a function of one's strength, their vitality, something that Nietzsche doesn't think is arbitrary or based on whim or that we choose or that is a moral failing or fault, something that it's not something that we're responsible for. Now, uh, with these statements on who he is, Nietzsche then gives us some background on his life, which I'd like to read from. I'm going to look at a long section, again, from Why I Am So Wise. Quote, My father died at the age of 36, he was delicate, kind, and morbid, as a being that is destined merely to pass by. 
more a gracious memory of a life than life itself. In the same year in which his life went downward, mine too went downward. At 36, I reached the lowest point of my vitality. I still lived, but without being able to see three steps ahead. Then, it was 1879, I retired from my professorship at Basel, spent the summer in St. Moritz like a shadow, and the next winter, than which not one in my life has been poorer in sunshine, in Naumburg as a shadow. This was my minimum. The wanderer and his shadow originated at this time. Doubtless, I then knew about shadows. The following winter, my first one in Genoa, that sweetening and spiritualization which is almost inseparably connected with an extreme of poverty of blood and muscle, produced the dawn. The perfect brightness and cheerfulness, even exuberance of the spirit, reflected in this work, is compatible in my case, not only with the most profound physiological weakness, but even with an excess of pain. In the midst of the torments that go with an uninterrupted three-day migraine, accompanied by laborious vomiting of phlegm, I possessed a dialectician's clarity par excellence, and thought through, with very cold blood, matters for which, under healthier circumstances, I am not a mountain climber, not subtle, not cold enough. End quote. Uh, following this, Nietzsche gives a number of facts about his physiology. He says, for example, his blood moves slowly. His doctors have never found a trace of fever in him, despite all of his bouts with his illness. Then further down, he says, quote, A long, all too long series of years signifies recovery for me. Unfortunately, it also signifies relapse, decay, the periodicity of a kind of decadence. Need I say after all this that in questions of decadence I am experienced? I have spelled them forward and backward. Even that filigree art of grasping and comprehending in general, those fingers of nuances, that psychology of looking around the corner, and whatever else is characteristic of me, was learned only then, is the true present of those days in which everything in me became subtler, observation itself as well as all organs of observation, looking from the perspective of the sick toward healthier concepts and values, and conversely looking again from the fullness and self-assurance of a rich life down into the secret work of the instinct of decadence. In this I have had the longest training, my truest experience. If in anything, I became master in this. Now I know how, have the know-how, to reverse perspectives. The first reason why a revaluation of values is perhaps possible for me alone." End quote. So importantly, this passage makes it clear that Nietzsche feels that his illness improved him, not only insofar as it required hardness in order to endure it, or however else you could phrase it, but it also gave him his ability to reverse perspectives. It makes him a perspectivist. He has the morbid and soft nature of his father, but also this richness of life that he describes in one of his notes as the higher health. He's a decadent, but as he will argue in the following passage, he's the opposite of a decadent. His pain has made him subtler, more nuanced in his powers of observation. In truth, Nietzsche credits seemingly the entirety of his philosophical insight to his illness. It is to his condition that he owes his perspectivism. Much of this passage, in an autobiographical sense, begins with Nietzsche's retirement from the professorship, his 36th year, the same year his father died. And with this sort of strange synchronistic rhythm, that's also one of Nietzsche's worst years. It's the year his condition gets so bad, he literally can't see three steps in front of himself. He's speaking quite literally there. And all the books of this period, uh, the, all the major works of the middle period, the start of Nietzsche's philosophical career, are works tempered in the forge of his physical suffering and pain. Nietzsche goes on in part three to express a deep gratitude to his father, that rural Lutheran soft pastor. He owes a great many of his privileges in life to his father, though he excludes his great yes to life itself, as this is Nietzsche's own creation. Nietzsche suggests that most people end up positively disposed towards him, and that even when he desired to push someone to be negatively inclined towards himself, Nietzsche says he never possessed the art of doing this, uh, that everyone likes him whether he likes it or not. 
and he says this is another thing he owed to his father, the universally loved country parson. And as mentioned in his classroom, Nietzsche tames every bear, right? Even the most buffoonish students were in rapt attention. He could draw the gold out of the basest soul. Even when so-called great and small misdeeds have been done to Nietzsche, he says it was never caused by his own ill will, that he never has had anything but goodwill. And so he goes on to thank his illness and the conditions of his life more generally, for his resistance to pity, writing that, quote, my experiences entitle me to be quite generally suspicious of the so-called selfless drives. It always seems a weakness to me, a particular case of being incapable of resisting stimuli. Pity is considered a virtue only among decadents, end quote. Instead, Nietzsche writes of the overcoming of pity as one of his noble virtues, and he clarifies the scene in Thus Spoke Zarathustra that we discussed in season two called The Convalescent, in which Zarathustra is faced with a temptation, which comes in the form of a cry of pity. Quote, pity tries to attack him like a final sin that would entice him away from himself. End quote. Furthermore, Nietzsche accounts his freedom from resentment as owing to his illness as well. This is also of great benefit as, quote, nothing burns one up faster than the effects of resentment. Anger, pathological vulnerability, impotent lust for revenge, thirst for revenge, poison mixing in any sense, no reaction could be more disadvantageous to the exhausted. Such effects involve a rapid consumption of nervous energy. End quote. Nietzsche describes what's been called Russian fatalism as a sort of cure for this, uh, maybe poison as a form of cure. That fatalism without revolt that's exemplified by the Russian soldier who, after having exhausted himself and having seen enough of the horrors of war, no longer willing to fight, but knowing that to refuse to fight is to die, simply lies down in the snow. Nietzsche writes, quote, no longer to accept anything at all, no longer to take anything, no longer to absorb anything, to cease reacting altogether, end quote. The context in which Nietzsche raises this example is a physiological one. We might consider again how the entire work has a physiological backdrop, because it is Nietzsche's description of his life and philosophy as a consequence of his physiology. So this Russian fatalism, is it good or bad? Well, he says here, quote, this fatalism is not always merely the courage to die. It can also preserve life under the most perilous conditions by reducing the metabolism, slowing it down as a kind of will to hibernate. Carrying this logic a step further, we arrive at the fakir who sleeps for weeks in a grave, end quote. So Nietzsche describes resentment, this feeling that one has been wronged by another or perhaps by life itself described as a sort of excess of nervous energy with nowhere to go. And it ends up being just a poison brewing within oneself that can never be released. Nietzsche therefore treats this attitude towards life as a physiological condition. And he takes that proposition relatively seriously and suggests it would be fatal to someone with his condition to become consumed with resentment. The way that resentment is so hyper-energetic that it exhausts you, it burns you out, it works you into a frenzy with no way to discharge that frenzy. The opposite of this is cold, slowing down, blood flowing slower, a kind of reducing of the metabolism. To accept everything without question, offer no resistance at all. A calming of activity to preserve one's life into the future without burning yourself out. So this Russian fatalism can be something life-preserving in some circumstances. But again, that's within the specific context that Nietzsche brings up. We could see how for a supremely healthy individual, becoming unwilling to give resistance to anything could be a rather pathological condition. And roughly speaking, this is Nietzsche's assessment of the condition of Jesus, by the way. By comparison, Buddhism, with its middle way, is something that Nietzsche actually gives praise to in this passage in Why I Am So Wise, number six. Buddha is, for Nietzsche, comparable to Epicurus, a noble approach to the suffering of the world without laying on this moral idea of sin or responsibility. 
to put an end to enmity, seeing all phenomena around you, including other human beings, as necessary and determined in their actions. And here he calls Buddha a profound physiologist, which is one of his most positive perspectives on Buddhism. And yet, in the very next section, in section number seven, Nietzsche proves how he is fundamentally different from the Buddhists in their pursuit of a life of peace and balance. Quote, War is another matter. I am warlike by nature. Attacking is one of my instincts. Being able to be an enemy, being an enemy, perhaps that presupposes a strong nature. It needs objects of resistance. Hence, it looks for what resists. End quote. We discussed the topic of war in the broadest possible scale, really, in the episode of that title from season three, uh, number 70, I believe, such that here Nietzsche makes it clear that offering no resistance is at best a temporary expedient. It's not a way of life. In fact, a sign of vitality is being able to be an enemy. And so looking for resistance, looking to meet resistance, meet a challenge. This is exemplified by Nietzsche once again, not within the realm of his actual life, where he resisted but little, mostly went along with a relatively natural course in life according to circumstances, mostly beyond his control. But within his philosophy, he celebrates his antipodes. There's the section in Beyond Good and Evil where he talks about how wonderful it is to have your antipode, the person who stands for the opposite of your own philosophical and moral ideas. Such a person gives you such an enemy, such a point of resistance, and the desire to test one's resolve against such resistance is what Nietzsche calls warlike and what he finds in himself. But Nietzsche emphasizes that where one feels contempt, one cannot wage war. Just as the Greeks, in their agonistic competition, struggled for greatness, but only amongst themselves, only among the aristocrats. Nietzsche writes in The Gay Science that he does not want to wage war against what is ugly. His only negation shall be passing by. In other words, Nietzsche does not admire what we might colloquially call uh, punching down, but be not because it's wrong or something like that, but because it's a sign of cowardice on the part of the person doing it. It's actually a desire not to meet sufficient resistance. Nietzsche then outlines his four propositions for determining how he wages war in the intellectual and philosophical arena. Quote, First, I only attack causes that are victorious. I may even wait until they become victorious. Second, I only attack causes against which I would not find allies, so that I stand alone, so that I compromise myself alone. I have never taken a step publicly that did not compromise me. That is my criterion of doing right. Third, I never attack persons. I merely avail myself of the person as of a strong magnifying glass that allows one to make visible a general but creeping and elusive calamity. Thus I attacked Wagner, more precisely the falseness, the half-couth instincts of our, quote, culture, which mistakes the subtle for the rich and the late for the great. Fourth, I only attack things when every personal quarrel is excluded, when any background of bad experiences is lacking. On the contrary, attack is, in my case, a proof of goodwill, sometimes even of gratitude. I honor, I distinguish by associating my name with that of a cause or a person, pro or con, that makes no difference to me at this point. When I wage war against Christianity, I am entitled to this because I have never experienced misfortunes and frustrations from that quarter. The most serious Christians have always been well disposed towards me. End quote. So Nietzsche has a right to attack Christianity, not because he bears Christians any ill will or they bear any ill will towards him, but quite the opposite. In fact, he honors whatever he attacks by associating his name with it. That's a beautiful attitude, I think, to have. And it helps clarify so much of how Nietzsche engaged in this aggressive and critical manner with other philosophers over the years, with Socrates, with Schopenhauer, with Kant, even Plato. The one name, however, that may raise an eyebrow here is Wagner. Since Nietzsche did write extensively and critically about Wagner, but this did in fact follow a serious personal falling out with the Wagners, the details of which remain somewhat unclear to this day. So whether we can believe Nietzsche on that point is up to you to decide whether there was no 
ill will towards Wagner. But the overall thrust of these rules for war, so to speak, the thing that unites all of them, is that an enemy is a good thing, something to celebrate, something to be grateful for, and that Nietzsche's method is thereby aimed at, we might say, quality of enemies. Why bother with a low-quality enemy who's already practically lost the battle? Why not attack the enemy that is victorious in the battle of ideas? That is the far worthier enemy to have. That enemy will give you everything you want out of a great opponent. And so we may say that just as Nietzsche creates an apparent ideal with the inner content of the anti-ideal, for example, in his image of the overman, Nietzsche also attacks, but without malice or contempt as a motivating driver. His critiques, sometimes damning, are executed with goodwill, or at least he claims. So if the first part, why I am so wise, is a physiological account of Nietzsche's predisposition to be able to seek the truth, this ability for hardness, this eye for switching perspective, this resistance to resentment and pity, cleanliness toward metaphysical baggage, and so on and so forth, we might say all of this can be summarized as an account of how Nietzsche came to hold the values he holds, how he gained his willpower, uh, his commitment to those values, which is, to his mind, the thing that really drives philosophy. The second part, entitled Why I Am So Clever, is Nietzsche's explanation of where his good, clear intellect comes from. And once again, the backdrop is physiological. He says that he believes the answer to this question is nutrition. This is in section one. Nietzsche is using the term nutrition in a broad extended sense, not only referring to what we eat, but to anything which we absorb on a sensory basis, anything we take into our body through any sense organ. So this would include nourishment in terms of food, but also what we drink, whether we drink alcohol. I mean, famously, Nietzsche eschewed alcohol, preferred to drink only water or occasionally some milk. And in this section, he calls the people of Munich the epicenter of Oktoberfest, his antipodes in this respect. In fact, he criticizes the entire German diet as causing indigestion. For Nietzsche, the diet of Piedmont in northern Italy, he says, is best suited towards him and his physiology. But in some way, once again, the physiological reality mirrors the matters of the spirit or the intellect. For the German education system, the kind of intellectual nutrition that's given to the German youth, is also a source of mental indigestion. It's a heavy, ponderous idealism that Germans ingest in terms of their national philosophy. This nutritive element also applies to exercise. Nietzsche was a determined, committed hiker, and he writes here, quote, Sit as little as possible. Give no credence to any thought that was not born outdoors while one moved freely, in which the muscles are not celebrating a feast, too. All prejudice comes from the intestines. End quote. Nietzsche then begins section two of this chapter with the striking claim that he will reiterate in some form again and again throughout Why I Am So Wise. Quote, the question of place and climate is most closely related to the question of nutrition. Nobody is free to live everywhere, and whoever has to solve great problems that challenge all his strength actually has a very restricted choice in the matter. The influence of climate on our metabolism, its retardation, its acceleration, goes so far that a mistaken choice of place and climate can not only estrange a man from his task, but can actually keep it from him. End quote. This is, of course, exactly what Nietzsche had to do in his own life, just as he determined that the nutrition of Germany was not suited to his physiology, so too was the climate completely opposed to his needs. He searches throughout Europe for places where men with esprit have lived, places with excellent dry air in comparison to the heavy, wet, moist air of Germany. He lists Paris, Provence, Florence, Jerusalem, Athens. Nietzsche writes, quote, genius depends on dry air, on clear skies, that is, on a rapid metabolism. End quote. On the contrary, Nietzsche lists places from his youth, his upbringing, where he taught as a professor, the places where he struggled the most with his physiological condition. Quote, Naumburg, Schulpforte, Leipzig, Basel, Venice, 
so many disastrous places for my physiology, end quote. Nietzsche then expands the use of the term nutrition in yet another way, saying that in addition to climate and place, quote, the third point at which one must not commit a blunder at any price is the choice of one's own kind of recreation, end quote. In Nietzsche's case, reading is his greatest recreation, and he'll later discuss music, particularly the music of Wagner. All of this is to be considered as nutrition, in that one takes in thoughts and ideas, which are then added to their brain's biome, so to speak. You take in these ideas when you read, when you discourse, when you attend a university. And music as a sensory experience also transmits sentiments, emotional states, the traces of which stay with you. And once again, the parallel is drawn insofar as the way in which Nietzsche eschews German books in exchange for books which are more suited to his constitution. Um, it's the exact same way in which he has to be discerning when it comes to determining what he eats. It's here that Nietzsche has a few fond words for Wagner, saying that, quote, all things considered, I could not have endured my youth without Wagner's music, for I was condemned to Germans. If one wants to rid oneself of an unbearable pressure, one needs hashish. Well then, I needed Wagner. Wagner is the antitoxin against everything German par excellence, a toxin, a poison that I don't deny. End quote. And uh, one could say that that's Nietzsche's most straightforward explanation of how he sees Wagnerian music. It's a poison, but nevertheless a poison that could be a cure in some contexts. In spite of his complicated relationship with Wagner, their falling out that happened some years previously to writing this book, and whatever remained unresolved between them when Wagner died, Nietzsche takes the time here to express gratitude to Wagner as well. To designate the three years he spent visiting the Wagners while still a professor at Basel as perhaps the happiest years of his life. But he came to understand Wagner's music as a seduction, a pessimism of weakness. And of course, as we've discussed, eventually Wagner succumbs to Christianity and to German nationalism. We've talked about all of this extensively on the podcast in the past. Here I want to focus exclusively on what Nietzsche might have seen as the physiological effect of Wagner's music, the kind of philosophy behind Wagner's music, the kind of sentiments that it promoted. From a physiological angle, Wagner is a man who had too great a dose of his own medicine. The broader point is to regard all of these sources of stimulation from the outside world as something that should be managed as one manages a diet. And Nietzsche continues on this point, quote, In all these matters, in the choice of nutrition, of place and climate, and recreation, an instinct of self-preservation issues its commandments, and it gains its most unambiguous expression as an instinct of self-defense. Not to see many things, not to hear many things, not to permit many things to come close. First imperative of prudence, first proof that one is no mere accident, but a necessity. The usual word for this instinct of self-defense is taste. It commands us not only to say no when yes would be selfless, but also to say no as rarely as possible. To detach oneself, to separate oneself from anything that would make it necessary to keep saying no. The reason in this is that when defensive expenditures, be they ever so small, become the rule and habit, they entail an extraordinary and entirely superfluous impoverishment. Our great expenses are composed of the most frequent small ones. Warding off, not letting things come close, involves an expenditure. Let nobody deceive himself about this. Energy wasted on negative ends. Merely through the constant need to ward off, one can become weak enough to be unable to defend oneself any longer. End quote. And so Nietzsche's advice is to put oneself in a situation where you have the least cause to have to put up a wall of defense to guard yourself against taking in what's bad for you. Nietzsche goes on to give an example about this. He says that if, instead of waking up to begin his day in the ancient, quiet, and aristocratic city of Turin, suppose he were to wake up in a German village like the one he grew up in, he says that he would immediately feel out of place, feel that he must keep everything about the town and the people around him at arm's length, 
that he'd have to constantly avoid taking in any of this poisonous Germanness, and so he would become like a hedgehog. One spends all their life's energy on being defensive, and it would have been better simply to place yourself into an environment that is healthier for you. And perhaps the greatest wisdom of Nietzsche here is that our our great expenditures are the small ones that we carry out every single day. That's what defines our experience and our character. And he expands on this at the beginning of the next part of the essay in section 10. Quote, One will ask me why on earth I've been relating all these small things which are generally considered matters of complete indifference. I only harm myself the more so if I am destined to represent great tasks. Answer, these small things, nutrition, place, climate, recreation, the whole casuistry of selfishness, are inconceivably more important than everything one has taken to be important so far. Precisely here, one must begin to relearn. What mankind has so far considered seriously have not even been realities, but mere imagining. More strictly speaking, lies, promoted by the bad instincts of sick natures that were harmful in the most profound sense. All these concepts, God, soul, virtue, sin, beyond, truth, eternal life. But the greatness of human nature, its divinity, was sought in them. All the problems of politics, of social organization, and of education have been falsified through and through because one mistook the most harmful men for great men, because one learned to despise little things, which means the basic concerns of life itself. End quote. So Nietzsche speaks in the form of perhaps a cliche, it's the little things that count. But there's something really profound insofar as it does seem to be a human weakness to become distracted with the grand story, a big idea, what Nietzsche calls a high-flying metaphysics, and to discount all of these day-to-day -day issues, all of the granular detail of our lives, in all of their mundane appearance, to dismiss that as being of little importance. Oh, that's just trivial day-to-day -day matters, right? But these are the threads of the tapestry of our lives. This is what is real in the most profound sense. Our day-to-day -day experience of life. That's where Nietzsche believes in reinvesting the value, the attention. All of these great, giant, big lies and swindles have been accomplished because of exactly the opposite type of attitude. By fixating on the grandiose. Fixating on God on the soul, on truth, on sin, on these huge concepts. But the real stuff of life is your daily struggle for nourishment to defend yourself against that which will only poison you, where you take your recreation, and so on and so forth. This question goes far beyond nutrition in the literal dietary sense, as we've outlined. I'm not going to spend quite as much time on the essay why I write such good books, but a few of the key takeaways from this part are Nietzsche's assertion that, quote, good is any style that really communicates an inward state, that makes no mistake about the signs, the tempo of the signs, the gestures, end quote. And he brags, no one has ever possessed such a multifarious arsenal of different artistic styles as he, that exist in Nietzsche's own writing. And so we might credit Nietzsche's perspectivism to his ability to write such good books, as a good book is here defined as a work that truly communicates something definite about the soul of the writer, and Nietzsche, with his subtle eye earned from his state of illness, can speak with varying rhythms of style, and uh, he can speak out of so many different states of the soul with which he's familiar. He doesn't claim that his books will be universally beloved, or that they are to be objectively regarded as good, but rather that, quote, Good style in itself is a pure folly, mere idealism, on the level with the beautiful in itself, the good in itself, the thing in itself, end quote. In fact, he lists out the various ways in which his writing will naturally become repulsive to people who are not physiologically compatible with it, we might say. Quote, every frailty of the soul excludes one once and for all even every kind of dyspepsia. One must not have any nerves. One needs a cheerful digestion. 
Not only the poverty, but also the nook air of a soul excludes one. Even more, any cowardice, uncleanliness, secret vengefulness in the entrails. A single word from me drives all his bad instincts into a man's face. End quote. And so, given this, Nietzsche explains how it is that he could have so many disapproving reviews of his work, especially from the German world, but also that his books could be of the type that, you know, people say that they can't put it down. It's a page turner. Perhaps the most remarkable aspect of this section is that Nietzsche relates several things that have been said about his work that are still often expressed by readers to this very day. Nietzsche writes, quote, I have some notion of my privileges as a writer. In a few instances, I have been told, too, how getting used to my writings spoils one's taste. One simply can no longer endure other books, least of all philosophical works, end quote. And I would certainly say that I have heard this expressed after reading Nietzsche. All other philosophical works seem a bit dry. <laughs> They're a bit uh, boring in comparison. The ultimate explanation for why Nietzsche writes such good books in his own words is that, quote, a psychologist without equal speaks from my writings, end quote. So Nietzsche, as a man deeply in touch with his own physiology, painfully aware at times of how powerfully his physiology influences his psyche, Nietzsche is by this token fated to be a psychologist, a man with such a subtle and powerful eye for this physiological root of all man's conscious life. Nietzsche says that, therefore, all of those propositions on which the world is really agreed, such as that happiness is the reward of virtue, or that selfishness and selflessness are opposites, these all seem to him as just naive blunders. When one is a serious psychologist, one cannot put any faith in the notion that happiness necessarily follows virtue, since so much of the evidence would point in other directions. Above all, what one needs for such observations is courage, pointing once again to the fact that not all or even most should be expected to follow Nietzsche on this point. Out of a certain physiological disposition, most will not be able to follow him. They'll be put off by being shown every bad instinct in their character, which Nietzsche says is inevitably revealed. The final part of Eke Homo, entitled Why I Am a Destiny, begins with some of the famous utterances of Nietzsche. It's here that he declares, quote, I am no man. I am dynamite. End quote. But what he says in the lines immediately after this perhaps help clarify the way Nietzsche sees his role why he didn't conceive of what he was doing as founding a new religion or a new ideal. This is because, quote, religions are affairs of the rabble. I find it necessary to wash my hands after I have come into contact with religious people. I want no believers. I think I am too malicious to believe in myself. I never speak to the masses. I have a terrible fear that one day I will be pronounced holy. You will guess why I published this book before. It shall prevent people from doing mischief with me. I do not want to be a holy man, sooner even a buffoon. Perhaps I am a buffoon. Yet in spite of that, or rather not in spite of it, because so far nobody has been more mendacious than holy men, truth speaks out of me. But my truth is terrible. For so far, one has called lies truth. End quote. And so this is a common theme in Nietzsche's writings, the rejection of followers. And I would argue it's not out of a mere disposition. It's, this is not some arbitrary aspect of Nietzsche's character that he just happened to not want followers. It's part and parcel with his entire philosophy that he wishes to establish no new ideals, no new idols, no new should or ought, or deontological commandment, that in his view is just going to pollute the psyche. His words are not for the many. They're not to be regarded as universal truths or an attempt to get at an objective statement of fact. He's trying to introduce a new sense or a new sensibility about life, which is not intended to have universal appeal or to be a new absolute to bind human minds with. To introduce such a new religion into the world would be a hideous evil, 
Rather than using the form of the ideal to destroy the ideal, it simply replaces it with an all the more powerful ideal, uh, an ideal that denies its own idealism and is thus rather pernicious. And that's the potential horror of Nietzsche being pronounced holy. And Nietzsche would rather be a buffoon than that. Another translation one could use here is clown. He'd rather be a clown than a saint. One of my favorite lines in all of Nietzsche's work then follows, quote, I contradict as has never been contradicted before, and am nevertheless the opposite of a no-saying spirit. I am a bringer of glad tidings like no one before me. I know tasks of such elevation that any notion of them has been lacking so far. Only beginning with me are there any hopes again. End quote. And so aside from containing one of the best examples of the raving, hyper-narcissistic Nietzschean prose that's fairly common during his later career, the idea of contradicting, but for the raison d'etre of creation. Nietzsche clarifies this in the next section where he quotes from his own work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra on Self-Overcoming, quote, Whoever wants to be a creator in good and evil must first be an annihilator and break values. Thus the highest evil belongs to goodness, end quote. So Nietzsche sees his destruction of this mendacious world, the ideal, the true world, as a quote-unquote good act, as clearing away a very harmful lie, and that to borrow a turn of phrase from the new atheists who have fallen out of fashion these days, Nietzsche's task is to entirely destroy this lie of idealism for creative purposes in the same way that a surgeon's purpose is to cut away your tumor removing or destroying something so that the body itself can have a chance of coming back to its full strength again. That's what Nietzsche is doing with religion, is excising it. And Nietzsche's assessment of Christianity and Christian values as the apotheosis of idealism is that it has turned Europe against itself, against its physiology, against the embodied reality that we live in. We see truth as something non-physiological. We see life as something non-physiological. We see the good as something non-physiological. These are the tenets of Christianity, since God is truth, God is good, God is love, and God is not physiology, God is a spirit, as the Bible says. Life in Christianity is a gift from the Holy Spirit, your consciousness, your intellect, your experience of the world. That's all something happening to a soul, a disembodied mind. You are not your body, which is a thing that just simply exists within a world of death and illusion, a false world that will eventually be destroyed by fire. So notice what Nietzsche has done in these sections. He's discussed his life as a physiological phenomenon. So too with his mind or his intellect and with his craft, with the books that he writes, with the truth as he has pursued it, and now with his destiny and the good he intends to do for the world. This is all oriented around his physiology. So by negating the Christian condemnation of life, creativity becomes possible once more. This is a creative act insofar as it restores the health of the modern mind. It returns it to a focus on the everyday physical reality of our experience, and Nietzsche uses his own life, the story of his life, as an example of this. The Christian type has so far been held up as the highest exemplar of humanity, and Nietzsche announces that he comes in opposition to this type. It's also here in this final part of Ecce Homo that he reveals the esoteric meaning, so to speak, which is now rather commonly known, of the name of Zarathustra. That Zarathustra historically, as another name of Zoroaster, the founder of Zoroastrianism, was the first man to make this essential division between good and evil, And so naturally, he should be the first to recognize his mistake. Quote, To speak the truth and to shoot well with arrows, that is Persian virtue. Am I understood? The self-overcoming of morality out of truthfulness. The self-overcoming of the moralist into his opposite. Into me. That is what the name of Zarathustra means in my mouth. End quote. Nevertheless, having committed all these words to the page in the course of writing Eke Homo, and having begun the book by demanding that, above all, do not misunderstand me, or we could translate it as don't mistake me, don't mistake me for something that I am not, 
uh, as Kaufman points out, Nietzsche's assertion that he has somehow prevented all mischief being done with his name uh, was violated at Nietzsche's very funeral by Peter Gast, who uttered the words, quote, holy be thy name to the coming generations, end quote. So don't mistake me for something holy. I want above all not to be made into something holy. And uh, Peter Gast, one of Nietzsche's closest friends and a man who helps him with revising his later works, immediately violates that when Nietzsche dies. And similarly, uh, as we all know, Nietzsche was misunderstood. He was mistaken for someone else. This happens to this very day. Uh, he was misinterpreted by his sister. He was misinterpreted by the Germans uh, in the lead up to World War II. And there's a sense toward the end of the book of Nietzsche's unassuaged fear in this inevitable outcome. As we near the end of the text, the aphorisms repeatedly begin with that same refrain. Have I been understood? Have I been understood? Have I been understood? It seems that Nietzsche is haunted by the, the inkling that he's not been understood or that he will be misunderstood. And he seemingly turns up the harshness, by the way, which is with each uh, repetition of this question. Morality itself conceived as the idiosyncrasies of decadence, designed as revenge against life. He dares to say that he's the man who, above all, uncovered Christianity. He saw past its veils. He beheld its ugly, sick, naked form. This was a religion that waged war on life, that condemned our physiological existence on every level. To even adopt a position of neutrality as regards Christianity would be a mistake, he says. This is the religion of nihilism, death, sickness. That would be like ignoring cancer. But it is not as if Christianity is some sort of affliction of the spirit with a cause in the soul or a cause in the willpower. That kind of understanding flies in the face of everything Nietzsche has argued. Following the logic we've discussed so far, the cause of Christianity itself is physiological. Christianity is described as a type of pathology, a type of sickness, which Nietzsche says he was the first to diagnose. That's the meaning of his great uncovering of Christianity. It's a project aimed at the elevation of mankind, but not by a new idealism, rather by excising that cancerous idealism that was preventing man from enjoying his full health, rather by diagnosing the signs and symptoms as a doctor does, a physician, right? But Nietzsche is a, uh, a more of a metaphysician in the sense of a play on words of a physician, a doctor diagnosing the cancers of metaphysics, the cancer of idealism in our thought. Nietzsche writes in section eight of this chapter, quote, the concept of sin invented along with the torture instrument that belongs with it, the concept of free will, in order to confuse the instincts, to make mistrust of the instincts second nature. In the concept of the selfless and the self-denier, the distinctive sign of decadence, feeling attracted by what is harmful, being unable to find any longer what profits one, self-destruction is turned into a sign of value itself, into duty, into holiness, into what is divine in man. Finally, this is what is most terrible of all, the concept of the good man signifies that one sides with all that is weak, sick, failure, suffering of itself, all that ought to perish. The principle of selection is crossed, an ideal is fabricated from the contradiction against the proud and well-turned-out human being who says yes, who is sure of the future, who guarantees the future, and he is now called evil. All this was believed as morality. Ecrasez la infâme. End quote. Of course, that last line in French, that was Voltaire's motto of war, also used against the church. It means crush the infamy, or put in a more forceful, less literal translation, crush the damn thing. To refer to Christianity as that which is infamous or damned um, conveys the sort of irony of Nietzsche's use of words, but here it's just one of the best expressions of why Nietzsche felt at war with Christianity in the first place. When the dust settles, the final have I been understood puts forward that beautiful dichotomy and restatement of the whole theme of Nietzsche's thought. Health versus sickness, not as a dialectic, 
but as a true dichotomy, a decision point between two opposing directions, and both referring to a concrete physiological reality. Nisha puts it into symbolic terms. Have I been understood? Dionysus versus the crucified. The healthy worldview of the Greek, the physiologically rooted morality and values of the Greek against the sick morality of the Christian. This is what Nietzsche stands for, and this is, in his view, the fate that he was handed. And it is on that note that he concludes the essay of why he is a destiny. While there is so much more that we could cover in Ecce Homo, and I, by the way, I do plan to discuss his words uh, as regards his own books in an episode later in the season, but uh, for now we're going to leave it here with this most remarkable and most precise among Nietzsche's formulations of his philosophy, Dionysus versus the crucified. And it's all the more powerful, I think, when we consider the ways in which Nietzsche tells us in this very text, he came to possess such a view of life. To return to the theme that we outlined at the beginning, and which is the title of this episode, we can therefore see why Ecce Homo is Nietzsche's apology. It is his statement of his special mission to Europe or to the Western world, to the entire history, the entire canon of Western philosophy in the same way that Socrates came on a special mission to the Athenians. What Nietzsche offers us is in the philosophical realm, in the realm of idealism, he brings us a physiological view of life. And thus he represents that kind of strange, monstrous inversion in the manner of Socrates, a inversion in which Nietzsche is willing to embrace brute realism and the celebration of physical struggle and a physiological rootedness for life, but in the realm of ideas. And ultimately what we have in this work, while it does contain a great deal that's autobiographical and a great deal that's interesting for analyzing Nietzsche's life, is ultimately a statement of this physiologism, of the putting the physiology first as the root and the cause and the origin of our psychological modes of being. And this can apply uh, when we get into Deleuze and we talk about Deleuze, what Deleuze calls Nietzsche's typology. These modes of being, whether they're a mode of health or sickness, of ascent or decline, are not just limited to physiology or psychology. Nietzsche groups these types together, which encompass really everything, the political, the moral, religious, the aesthetics. All of these things are included um, in assessing a type, we might say. But this is incredibly valuable to us in seeing this key distinction articulated at the end, when Nietzsche is sort of um, expressing his dire fear that he will not be understood. He gives us this most forceful and straightforward framing of his entire project, which we've cited before, Dionysus versus the Crucified. And he, again, ties it not to an apprehension of universal truth, but as his fate handed to him by his body, by his physiology, to be able to perceive, to have an eye for these two orientations, these two directions for life. That is Nietzsche's apology, Nietzsche's defense of his role in philosophy and why he thinks he was actually doing a quote-unquote good thing, an incredibly valuable thing for the history of Western philosophy, giving us a new lens, a new perspective with which to look at concepts and philosophers and people and events. All right, well, uh, that's all for today, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.